Hello and welcome to another episode of A Senior View. Tonight's episode is never too old or never too late to change, to pivot, to move towards a passion, a project, or a different way of thinking. And like Google says, maybe it's time to recalculate. So tonight on our podcast, we have Wendy who went from being a young mom with kids, went back to school, became a medical transcriptionist, went back to school again, got her BA in English at 30. She became uh, the head of marketing for a radio station. Then she did a pivot of passion. At 45 years old, with the kids grown and gone, she moved to Toronto to become an actress. On the other hand, we have Kevin Shea, who co-authored or authored 19 books on hockey, started out in radio, went to a record label, went to a charity doing nonprofit, and then went to the Hockey Hall of Fame, works for the Maple Leafs, and has done a number of pivots in his career. And also we have Linda Lord. Linda's going to tell you about her own journey to higher education later in life, but as well, she's going to talk about the mental health issues that come out when these pivots happen, because sometimes in your career and more now than ever before, I don't think our parents live through this quite as much as we have, is that sometimes you go to work and your job is gone and that pivot or that move, or that change is pushed on you, and you don't have a choice. So uh, I'd like to open up with asking, what was the scariest thing that you felt about the pivot that you took, the change that you did? Let's start with Wendy. When you said, okay, and we had this conversation many times when we were co-workers, I kept saying, your passion is theater, you're an actress, your tribe is in Toronto, Go to Toronto. What was the scariest thing about making that choice? Uh, I don't think for me it was scary heading to Toronto. I think I was scared that if I failed, I would have to tuck my tail between my legs and walk back home to Windsor. Um, Not that there's anything wrong with Windsor, but just that for me, it would mean that I hadn't succeeded. So I think the fear of failure is is largely what held me back. It was funny because I kept finding myself in my group of theater friends and many of them had moved to Toronto and moved back. And I was always drawn to them and kind of picking their brains. And um, I always said to them, you know, what, what brought you to Toronto and what brought you back home to Windsor? And everybody's answer was different, but while questioning them, I think I was really questioning myself. Like, why aren't you going to Toronto and why are you so scared, Wendy? Hey, and Kevin, let, let's talk about you. Um, you had changes that were like you went in and the job was gone or you saw that the job was going to come to an end. What were your thoughts in that moment? Am I going to stay in that industry? Like, what am I going to do? What were your thoughts in that moment? Well, I had two of those moments, Lori. Uh, one of them was working for a record company that uh, was going bankrupt. And we were told in no uncertain terms that most of the staff was going to go into a meeting that day and walk out knowing that they either had a job or that they were completely done. And I knew the, uh, the situation. So when I walked out and didn't have a job, all of a sudden it was, what do I do now? And and so I opened, you know, I hung my own shingle out. I put my own little uh, publicity company together and the artists that had been on that record company all came under my little company. So I was lucky but also fortunate that I'd worked very hard and and I had great relationships with these artists and was able to continue on for a while. But I knew that I wasn't an entrepreneurial spirit per se. I'm an entrepreneur, but I, but owning my own company, running my own company wasn't something for me. So uh, when I got an opportunity to get a full-time job, I took that, but it was six or seven months after the fact, and that was all good. The scariest one for me, if you don't mind my mentioning, was no, I was no. with Princess Margaret Cancer Foundation. We were raising funds for cancer research. And all of a sudden, all of the management, all of the senior management anyway, was wiped out in one fell swoop. And I was 59 years old at the time. And as much as everybody said, oh, Kevin, you'll have no problem getting a job. Oh, people are going to be beating down your door. It was amazing to find out that that wasn't necessarily the case. Yeah. People spoke highly of me. That was wonderful. I had a a very strong resume. I had wonderful acknowledgments that went with it. But 
I went for, I don't know, I probably applied for a hundred jobs and I think I got five interviews of which three of them took me to the final one or two, but I didn't get those jobs. But fortunately all along as my side job, I had been uh, been a writer and working in hockey and teaching and things of that sort. And I was able to parlay that in short order into a full-time job with the Hockey Hall of Fame. So again, it was right place, right time, having good network and working my butt off so that I had the uh, the foundation built for me already. So while there was some anxiety, thank goodness it was short-lived. And Linda. Yes. Let's talk about your journey. Let's talk about going back to school. At what age did you go back to school? Uh, the most recent time, um, I went back in 2017 and got my master's in expressive arts therapy. And then my academic advisor said, you know, we really think you have a contribution to make at the PhD level. And I, no one had ever said that. No one had spoken into my life in that way before. And so why not believe her? And so then I did my PhD. I graduated last July, a year ago, July. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and it was a real journey. It was a self-directed uh, degree. I don't know if your listeners will know what that means, but basically they hand you the syllabus and then you come up with all of your own resources, articles, books, assignments, and then you complete all of your own assigned assignments, and then they'll mark them and tell them whether or not you did a good job with your own assignments. So it was a really intense program. Um, my master's was a little bit easier than my PhD. I wanted to quit my PhD. There's no question about that. Um, I'm not a solid academic. Statistics still scare me. And uh, my daughter said, who is in her early 20s and was completing her undergrad, what kind of a role model would you be for me, mother, if you decided to walk away from this degree before graduating? And I humbly hung my head and said, I would be a terrible role model. Therefore, I shall finish my degree. Um, but that's, I was an older student and, um, I was very fortunate that I had the support of my family and my friends because I was still single parent and trying to put food on the table and doing it, uh, doing a degree in disenfranchised grief and play building. And how do we use expressive arts to bring meaning to grief and loss, um, while my father was dying. Mm -hmm. Oh, Wow. So that that was wow. a tough road. Wow. Yes. A tough road. It was. So you're talking about grief and loss. Yeah, um, when you lose your job, when you've been there for so long, there is grief and loss. There is a death. Um, Wendy, how did you feel as you left, when you've left all your family and moved to Toronto to the unknown? So there wasn't so much there is grief and loss. And Kevin, also, when you, you know, at, you know, 59 years old, leaving your your job, which through no fault of your own. So that's like grief and loss. How, how do you turn the corner on that? Wendy, did you want to go first? Oh, whatever you like. <laughs> Let's go with Wendy. But how did how did you turn that corner? Um, I, I think in many ways I'm, um, I've turned the corner and then in some ways I, ha I haven't turned the corner. So my parents are both getting older and when the pandemic hit, um, you know, I now really can't go to Windsor and because of the demographics of COVID, it was much worse in Toronto for a long time before it got to Windsor and I was terrified I would bring it home to my parents and get them sick. So I didn't see them. Uh, I didn't see anyone last Christmas. At Christmas, I sat home and, and watched Bridgerton on Netflix. Um, so there were, <laughs> thank goodness for that. Um, but there were really some costs that came with it that just I never, ever dreamt of. Mm -hmm. um, my parents are fine. They're both double vaccinated, thank goodness. Um, but there, there was uh, definitely some things that I didn't bargain for. Um, and you really have when everything is shut down and all you can do is go for a walk, you really have time to mentally weigh out like, okay, is what I'm getting worth what I'm losing or what I'm sacrificing? Um, and that can, that can be an okay thing to do from time to time. But I think in the pandemic, there was so much time and you could kind of overanalyze if you weren't careful. Um, I feel like I'm doing okay with it. Um, which is very fortunate. Not, not everybody can, um, but I, I feel like I'm in a pretty good place, uh, but, but it has, there have been some costs and really some uncalculated costs as well. Kevin. Well, so I, I, 
although I don't suffer from depression, I had heard too often of colleagues who had lost their jobs at, a, at an older age who fell into the depths of despair. And I wanted to make sure that that didn't happen. So I was fortunate in a couple of ways. I was already, I was already teaching, uh, so I had that going for me. I was doing some freelance work for the, uh, the Hockey Hall of Fame at that point. Um, I volunteered to be a feline enhancement volunteer. What the heck? What's that? Uh, <laughs> it means I go into uh, the Durham Humane Society twice a week to pet cats and try and get them ready for socializing oh. to be adopted. So I did that because I just thought, okay, you know, I've got time and I just want to stay positive. But in the meantime, I also did a number of freelance things. I put my uh, my name out there. My network came through and I was writing bios for a Blue Rodeo, a band on Warner Music. And I was, I was writing a, a, a series of columns for the Toronto Star. So I just found some freelance work that kept me busy, uh, brought some income in too, although income wasn't necessarily a, a major concern um, because I'd you know, been pr- pretty prudent along the way, but I just wanted to stay busy and occupied and feel like I was contributing and, and worthy in some way. And it bought me enough time to get to go from part-time at the, or at least a contract with the Hockey Hall of Fame into a, a mm-hmm. full-time job as well. And I continue to do all those other things as well. COVID would, didn't allow me to pet cats for a little while, but I've just gone back to do that too. So, <laughs> so that was it. It was just staying yeah. positive and, uh, and, and using the tools that I had already to, uh, to find some other things that would keep me busy and, and uh, pleasantly occupied. Well, well, let me ask you, when we get to the um, retirement years, do you find, this is a general question, do you find that the, you, there are people who are angry, that they're coming to retirement, they, uh, you know, it, whether it's, fi- I'm not financially ready, I'm not emotionally ready, I'm angry I didn't get to do these type of things. Do you think that feeds into a really negative retirement plan at some point? I'll speak to that. I think generally we are a more angry population. And I don't think many people are going to wait till retirement to be angry. Mm -hmm. Um, And as we know about emotions, what usually is underneath anger is sadness. And so when you encounter people in youth or midlife or retirement, and they're really angry, uh, I would invite you to engage in a conversation around what makes you sad. Uh, Maybe it is a missed opportunity a job that they always wanted that they never got the education for, never took the chance to apply for, um, just didn't put themselves out there. And they're sad because they made difficult and different choices when they were young. Uh, If you're raising a family, maybe you don't have the opportunity to put as as much money away Mm -hmm. as you thought that you would. So um, anger is prevalent in our society across generations. Uh, when you speak specifically to retirement, though, I I lead with the sadness question rather than the anger. Mm-hmm. Anger is usually a manifestation of sadness. Mm-hmm. I don't see, um, I don't remember uh, my parents or that generation, uh, the 50s or, you know, as they retired, being as angry as I see now, you're at, you're right. It, there is a an anger before. Maybe it was underlying, like oh well, I didn't get to do this. Oh, you know, this just didn't happen, and it was acceptable. Now it's m- more um, bitter. I didn't get the raise. I didn't get the promotion. Oh, they let me go after fifteen years, and there and then that that the, all that hostile comes out, and then they sit in it. How does that affect their mental health moving forward and the people around, Linda? Well, I mean, it has a a huge impact. And I think that part of it also speaks to expectations. What do we expect that life is supposed to give us? And what are we supposed to accomplish? I had things that I was going to do by the time I was 20. Eh. 30, eh, 40. Eh. I mean, I was going to be in Ireland at 40. That was my birthday present to myself. And thank goodness I went on my daughter's high school trip to Europe or I would still not have gotten to, to Ireland. So I think we have these expectations of milestones and what we're supposed mm-hmm. to have accomplished. And I think that um, there are certain expectations that women have too. Uh, what we should accomplish. We live in Mm -hmm. two worlds. One of my feet is firmly planted in the world of my mother and domesticity 
and one of my feet is firmly planted in renegade. I'm going to come to Toronto with you. I'm packing my bags this weekend, <laughs> Wendy, and we're going to become roommates. Yeah. Um, yes. And so there's this this expectation, and I didn't achieve what I expected to achieve or my parents expected me to achieve and my parents put me through university and so I'm supposed to do something really grand with my life and I think that that can manifest itself in anger and sadness Mm -hmm. I would really like to hear from someone else on this though too (laughs) yes please do well if I can just jump in first of all Linda I think you're spot on and I and I really appreciated what you said about sadness over over anger and I think a lot of us have this euphoric dream that we'll be able to stay in one career well maybe more like not a euphoric dream for us but what are we saw our parents and our grandparents doing which was staying in one career for for the better part of their lives and then uh, retiring with a pension and all of those sorts of things and those days seem to have passed many many years ago Uh, amongst my colleagues i find that that many had hoped that they could retire on their own terms and that happens very seldom and then you run into what people will conveniently call ageism, and I and I can't say that it's not true, but mm-hmm. is that they don't get to stay to the very end. Somebody pulls the uh, the shoot before they're quite ready to. There's that anger that goes with that, the sadness that goes with that even more so, and and the fact that they are unable to find anything else at that point. So they end up driving an Uber. Nothing wrong with these things, or working in another job of some sort that wasn't what they want to do, but they do need to continue to, uh, to bring some money into the household. So the sadness and anger are paired in that, in that sense. And, and it's an unfortunate part for most people in, in the world today. Wendy? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I can definitely see how sadness would be the underlying cause of anger. And I think, I don't know if it's for our generation, um, to me, you know, going to sort that out with a therapist or with a counselor, it, in our generation, the taboo is just coming off of that. Um, I feel like the younger generation is really um, grasping onto that is a good, healthy choice to make. And our generation is like, you know, a little bit more of the, no, no, everything's fine. We don't talk about, shh, we don't talk about that. Um, and so I like that it's becoming a common conversation and and it's not a, something to be ashamed uh, of to go sort it out, but that it's a healthy choice and that it's self-care to go get that sorted out so that your life isn't dominated by, you know, overwhelming sadness or overwhelming anger. And that's having effects on all kinds of different relationships in your life and in even, maybe even your work life or maybe even your retirement life, wherever you are, um, that you would be able to find the joy in in every day and maybe not have those giant overwhelming expectations. Um, If you can live without them, then you're disappointed a little bit less. So I think there's a a sweet spot there somewhere between hopes and goals and dreams and gigantic expectations of what life should be handing us. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, It's tough to manage all that, but it's a good goal. (laughs) Kevin, you wanted to join in. So I just, I, I think about all of us who are, in a certain uh, age demographic, but but when we think about our children or our, the children of our friends or whatever, I sometimes worry about what kind of a world that we're handing off to them. They they don't necessarily have pensions. They've they've jumped from job to job out of necessity in many cases, uh, just out of frivolity in many cases as well. Um, you're not able to purchase the houses that uh, that we've been in many cases fortunate enough to be able to do paying exorbitant amounts for in Toronto area, certainly. And I I can't speak for the the Windsor area per se, but I, you know, I certainly have friends living in the area still and, and, and uh, realizing that the ability to have the lifestyle that many of us have been fortunate to have isn't going to be there for them. And how is that going to manifest itself in them later on? So I know we're worried about us right now and rightfully so, but we do have to look at uh, the generation that follows too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you would mention that because I overheard my son and daughter talking about real estate uh, just a couple of nights ago, and wow. uh, they were on real on um, a couple of websites, and they were looking at starter homes that were you know three, four, five hundred thousand dollars, and the Windsor market is hot right now. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, you want you have your asking price at three fifty, you might get four twenty five. 
And that's after a bidding war. Mm -hmm. And so you're absolutely right, Kevin. I mean, our, this next generation is looking longingly at what we have. And, right. you know, how mm -hmm. much of, are we looking at the generation before us mm -hmm. saying, oh, but they had it so great. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very interesting conversation that I wish we could contribute to with a solution tonight. Uh, but just maybe just letting them know that we care and we see what they're going through and we're hearing that it's a it's a struggle for them and, and we can offer hope and and some of our experience that might be relevant. I think what our children will take from us is that, and you know, and I've had it happen numerous times in my career where it's you're the pink slip and you're not the worst person, you're not the best person, you're just the person today that's going to go. And, you know, and there's no blame or there, there's just like, just go. There's also, you know, the culture of where you're at and, and all the, the social, you know, things that go with it. But I think our children will learn to that we were resilient and that they will take a piece out of that book. And by being resilient, meaning uh, I didn't want the job, I had to take the job. It's not my dream. I did it. You know, kind of like our parents, you know, like, well, that's where we take that leaf out of their book is that, you know, um, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be that. My mother always said I had to be a nurse. I have to be a nurse. I, I'm, I'm a nurse. I'm a good nurse. It pays, but it's not what I wanted to do, but it's what I, sh what was expected of me. So when our children see that, you know, we're doing what is expected and then the rug gets pulled out, then, it, you know, it separates uh, the girls from, you know, women. And you've got, you've got to do what you've got to do to put, you know, bread on the table. But I think you still have to instill that you can still have that passion for whatever you love. Like this is a, this is a temporary fix to move to a full-time wish or a passion. And I hope that, I hope that I did that with my children in some way to say, do what you love, you know, and uh, it doesn't mean you have to quit your job and do it a hundred percent. But, you know, I think that they'll learn that we rebound back and maybe they will rebound back because um, we were raised with you. You had maybe two jobs and you stayed until you decided to leave because you had union, you had pension, you had... And then that whole culture. That's another thing about never too old, never too late. When you leave your social friends in that business or that work atmosphere, it's a little scary because they... I'm sure you can all say, people just fade away. So that... that how do you put a good spin on, like Kevin, you said, nobody called. You're great. You're the best, Kevin. You won't have a problem. <laughs> and it's like, you know, nothing. Silence. Well, we all seem to figure it out somehow. Every generation has somehow. And, and, but I think that what you say, there's a real grain of truth in never letting go of your passion, hoping, working towards whatever it happens to be, but, but being able to follow that, uh, that, that passion that you have for a particular area or whatever at that point. So if I think about the media, for example, and Lori, this is one that'll hit close to your heart, but the media has over the last decade, maybe even two decades has evaporated in a, an astonishing way. Mm -hmm. And those of us, I was very fortunate in my early days that I was able to, you know, graduate from the university of Windsor with my communications degree. And I wanted to work in radio so I wasn't going to work in a big market like Windsor. That was that was un, un, unheard of at that point. So I went to Northern Ontario and did the all-night show at a radio station in North Bay. And you uh, follow the brass ring and chase it from there. And, well, those jobs don't exist anymore because they're soundtracked. They're, they're syndicated. They're, you know, any number of different things. I, I can't speak for every uh, occupation, obviously, but this is just one. So you have to figure out, is it a podcast? Well, that seems to be the new way to broadcast in many ways. Can you monetize it in some way? Some can, but for the most part, it's, it's a lark, it seems. So it's so tough to figure, but, but keeping your passion as intact as you possibly can and, uh, and inventing and reinventing yourself is so important in the, the most positive way. And maybe you do have to take that job that you don't necessarily want but you got to keep your eye in in my mind anyway. You've got to keep your eye on the prize and and see if you can't pivot into uh, to something that 
you're going to look forward to going to every day rather than just accepting a paycheck and dreading having to go. Wendy, do you want to jump in on that? Um, just to tag on to the end of what Kevin said, you know, it reminds me of this um, uh, call, colleague that I had or a coworker that I had, and I had, was quitting this job that I had in Windsor to go to the University of Windsor um, to study English. And I was, um, I think I was around, I was in my mid thirties, maybe 30, 35. And um, she was a good friend of mine and she, her name was Karen. And she looked at me and she said, you know, aren't you scared? And I said, I'm scared. And I said, scared of what? She said, aren't you scared to leave your job? You know, I was a single mom of three at the time. And she said, aren't you scared? I looked at her and I said, what I'm scared of is coming here every day and watching my dream die. That is what I am scared of. Mm -hmm. (laughs) No, very good. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and there's not the taboo of changing careers like there used to be. Like people would say to you, what are you doing? Why are you leaving? Like if this, if it was the sixties and you did that, I mean, people would be, you would be on the front page of the paper because it it was uh, so out of line. First of all, a divorcee with children going back to school. Who does she think she is? And that's all gone. Crazy woman quits job. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, You know, and bravo that you did. Yeah. Yeah. But here we are. um, and, And those taboos are all gone and anything goes but I think uh, uh, a lot of it is fear, fear-based. Yep. And, and they're afraid of failing. When failing isn't failing, failing is just taking another turn to figure, okay, that didn't work. I didn't fail at it. It didn't work. I'm going to try this. And I think that, that piece of hopefulness is what is really lacking. So exactly. tell me, what is that piece of hopefulness that keeps you this is going to work or this is working. I think you have to make your mind up about it before you set out on that path. So if you, if you think of failure, or even if I think of failure, failure is not getting back up and trying again, whether it's your second time, your 22nd time or your 302nd time quitting is for me is the failure not continuing to try when I know that I know, and it's been all these years, it was 40 something years that I knew that I wanted to act. And I just tried desperately to extinguish that in my mind. And I knew that I knew that I knew that that's what it was. Um, So for me, because I know that's what my passion is, not trying is the failing part. Trying and not whatever, not landing the role, not landing the callback, not whatever it is, That part to me, I don't look at that as failure. I look at that as an attempt. Failing would be packing my bags and going home. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, Kevin, tell me about when you got the job with the Hockey Hall of Fame. Clearly a dream job. You know, you worked with them all for many, many years. Was Was that the point that you said, okay, I can relax now? okay, this is what's happening. Did you have that, well, that Oprah moment? Well, I don't know that I ever, ever sat back and exhaled and thought, I've made it now, because I'm a determined guy, and it's always been that way. So if I can even step back, when I was in university, I was determined that I was going to work in the radio industry, and I made it happen. You just do it. And then, you know, I was very fortunate that I was segueing into the music industry. It was just kind of a an adjunct, for, well, it wasn't an adjunct from the radio side, but they are very closely entwined. And I was determined that I was going to rise to the top in, in that industry and was very fortunate to have done that, and it, to my satisfaction anyway. And then, uh, and then when the company went bankrupt, I was determined that I was going to work in a, I wasn't going to settle. I was going to work in something that I really wanted to do I never thought that it would be in fundraising for cancer research, but but it's an odd thing too, is, is my father had passed away from prostate cancer just around that time. And I started to think a great deal about mortality and about my own life and things of that sort. And I thought, you know, here I am working in music and all these fun and frilly things and people think it's the greatest job in the world and they are. But at the same point, I think there's got to be something bigger and deeper and, and And so because my father had passed of cancer, I started to look into the cancer field 
and whoever would have thought. And I was able to use my skills. <laughs> I fluked, I guess, in many ways, but I was able to use my skills. I applied and, and let people know that I could do media, I could do marketing, I could do publicity, and got a job that I didn't really, really didn't deserve to get, but I was able to step in and, and show my merit in, in a different way than most people would, and it worked out very well. So there was that. But then when that one came to an end, you know, I'd already... <laughs> Can I, if I, you don't mind, I'm going to tell another story. Mm -hmm. When I was working for the record company, um, I we were we were putting together a compilation CD, a, a collection of songs. My idea was songs that you would hear at a at a at a hockey rink. So you can think of the hockey song by Stomp and Tom Connors and Fifty Mission Cap by the the Tragically Hip and Big League by Tom Cochran and Final Countdown by Europe, et cetera, et cetera. So I, th I threw the pitch out to my boss. He, he loved it. So I thought, if I can get the Hockey Hall of Fame to get involved as well, it will really help us. So knowing that I had to license a photo for the front cover of the, the CD at that time, which was, I mean, we don't do so, that so much anymore, but the CDs are still out there. I needed to license a photo photograph, but I thought, while I'm there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pitch them the idea of if we can – use your logo on the front of our CD, we'll give you a dollar from every sale, thinking that was going to parlay into a, a large a large payday for both of us, as it turned out it did. But while I was there, sitting in the office of, of the man who now is my boss, but I was sitting in his office, and he said, I, I, I need a couple of minutes to look for some photos for you, Kevin. And while I was there, I picked up some 8 by 10 photographs, 8 by 10 photographs, rather, that were on his desk. And I said, oh, my God, Mel Sweeney, you know, Mel Hill. Oh, Sweeney Schreiner. Oh, Jackie McLean. He said, wait a minute. How do you know these guys? I said, I'm just totally into hockey. And he said, wait, wait a minute here. How, these, are, these are pictures of guys that we can't identify. Well, hang on here. So I think there were seven or, sorry, I think there were 10 of them there, and I got seven out of 10, and mostly guys from the 1940s. So he said, look, I know you're a vice president. I know these things, but would you ever consider volunteering with us? I said, well, I can't. I've got a full-time job. He said, well, just, you know, just every once and again, if you want to come by, we'd love to have you here and, and uh, can't pay you, but uh, it gets you into the hockey world. So without even realizing it and loving passion, or sorry, loving hockey with a passion, all of a sudden I got my foot in the door so that when the and then I started to teach hockey history and all the it just kind of spread from there did all of their magazines so that when the door was closed at the Princess Margaret Cancer Foundation all of a sudden I, I went from getting a couple of contracts with the Hockey Hall of Fame to being embraced as as uh, overseeing their their education and uh, and editorial side of things and so I do a a number of things at that point, but it was determination. I've gone on and on, and I really apologize, but okay. I, I, I was determined. I had a vision. I knew what I wanted to get, and there was nothing that was going to stop me, and fortunately, a few doors opened up along the way, so I think if there's any lesson that's there, it's, it's that, you know, keep your eye on the prize, as I said earlier on, and, and keep that passion there, and and use the, the, the tools that you've been I was going to say encumbered with, not by any means, but the tools that you've been able to accumulate over the years as well. And, and it's amazing that uh, people will look out for you someplace. So that's my story. And I'm sticking to it. There we are. It's a great story. I'm sorry for going on. And no, on. no, Linda, no, Wendy. not at all. Oh, Don't no, apologize. That's great. Great yeah. stories. Um, I love that I'm speaking to colleagues and peers my age who will understand this reference. Do you remember Weebles? Oh, yeah. yep. The round they bottom wobble, but they don't, but they don't fall, down. fall down. That that's the thing. <laughs> and so early on, um, it that became my avatar, right? Uh, you can knock me down, but I'm going to come back up. And I'm not staying yep. down long. And when I do come back, hold on, because I'm coming back stronger than when I went down the first time. And I've been knocked over a couple of times, as I'm sure the rest of the panel has been. Uh, but it's that getting back up, doesn't matter how hard you get hit. And knowing that there's something to stand back up for. And whether it's your faith, it's your family, it's your career, it's your passion, it's what is it that's going to get you back up on your feet. And sometimes you need to reach up and have somebody take your hand to help you stand back up. But that comeback kid factor, 
I love pivoting. I have been pivoting my entire career. In fact, if I was to stop pivoting, my children would look at me and ask what was wrong. Because (laughs) in my very heart of hearts, I'm a creative. I don't care what I'm creating. I can be creating content. I can be creating plays. I can be creating stories. I can be creating personas for myself. I can be creating a business. But you're not going to keep me down. You aren't. And so, bravo, Linda. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank and you. Bravo, Wendy, too. My yeah. God, what a story. Jeez. So hu- huge bravo props. Kevin. I, I'm glad you brought that up about uh, speaking to our age group because uh, when I went back to school the last three years ago, of course, the oldest in the class, they kind of guessed I was a little older. And they asked me continuously, how old are you? How old are you? And I would just tell them, I'm closer to 100 than you are. (laughs) I wouldn't tell them, (laughs) I wouldn't tell them my age because it would change their perception of me and working with me. And on the last day of class, um, I had one, just one person, because by that time they had forgotten about it and knew that I was great on a team, uh, you know, like, uh, 90% of the people in the class were international students. So they had to go out and get stories. Well, they've been in Windsor 10 minutes. They don't know where to get a story. And having worked, you know, in radio and social services, I would just pull out my phone and go, okay, I'm going to call so-and-so and and you're going to ask for Anita. And this is the number. And it's, it's this go. So they knew that they could count on me for things like that or, and I knew that I could help, they would help me with the computers that I, if I didn't know the software, because you have to remember, they've had software since grade school. You know, it's very normal for them. Not so much normal for me, an angry Italian woman. No. (laughs) So uh, I did on the last day, I told the one who kept, he he was the most, uh, you know, uh, his name was Harsh. What's your age? And when I told him I was 63, it was a completely different person. No, come on. I was like, yeah. I said, age is mind over matter. If I don't mind, it doesn't matter. And he was just like, you're older than my mom. I'm well, thank you. So, <laughs> but, and he was just, and I was really glad I didn't tell them. And it's not that I'm ashamed of my age. I don't care. I wear it loud. I wear it proud. I am here. But I find when you say your age, it changes the conversation. It changes the, you know, the ageism. Is, and it's not like, oh, we have to be more respectful or whatever. It's like, ooh, go to the other side of the room. Like, have you experienced that in your travels as, as you've gone on your journeys to say, well, you're too old to be an actor, Wendy. And Kevin, like, what do you know? You know, like, what's this old guy doing working for the Maple Leafs? Like, and, and Linda, what, what are you doing in school here? Well, I think the irony of it is that I chose to stop coloring my hair. And so the minute I became silver, people didn't ask me anymore. They just started opening doors. And it's like, I'm not 90. I have gray hair. Thank you so much. I went wakeboarding this summer with my family. Hello. Right? And so it's about that perception of what you look like. I mean, Kevin, you're distinguished. Mm-hmm. The, your Thank audience, you. your audience can't see <laughs> Kevin's hair, but Kevin has silver hair and is quite distinguished. Yeah. But then look <laughs> at Linda, the old lady with the gray hair who should have it pulled up in a bun with a couple of knitting needles in it and, and know her place and her age. Yeah. Yeah. I found that, um, when I did say my age, uh, I thought, boy, I'm, I'm so glad I didn't tell them because I think they would view me as taking a seat from someone younger. Wow. You know, mm. I and I and I have felt that a number of times that um, when it comes to it, you know, some of, some of my friends are 40, 50 years old. Some of them don't know how old I am. Some of them do. Um, when that number comes up, 60, it's like, it's not the end. It's a number. Yeah. I mean, I, I, when my friend turned 40, she didn't go to work for a week. She was just like, I'm 40, it's over, it's over. So finally, I went there and I said, it's a number. And she goes, when do you turn 40? I said, yeah, four years ago. Like, (laughs) like, oh, no, no. Like, I wish this 
ageism would stop focusing on a number because, oh, you're 60. Oh, you're a senior. I hate that word, by the way, senior. I mean, it, it should be changed to sensational. You're sensational. <laughs> First Which of all, you, uh, yes to that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, two things. So when I went back to the University of Windsor, I think I was 35. And it's funny because I remember being worried about ageism. I remember thinking like, ooh, what am I going to encounter? You know, or what? It was totally fine. It was so fine. It was not even a thing. And now when I look back on that, it was over 15 years ago. And I think it's really funny because clearly I was a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but the second thing, and never in my wildest dreams did I ever see this coming, but just in the last little while, um, my auditions are a huge age range. So it's even a 15 year age range that they're calling for. And I, the other day, went to the store and got some silver spray so I could silver out my hair for these auditions because I think that I look a little too young for the roles that I'm being submitted and called to audition for. So never did I ever dream I would need to look older, but here we are. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll take it. <laughs> and it, it so can I be was fun. always the young kid. Uh, I was the, you know, I skipped a grade when I was, uh, when I was a kid. So I graduated before my peers and, you know, uh, working in the radio side of things. I was always the young kid. I was the kid when I worked in the record industry, I was the kid. But then all, all of a sudden things started to change. And the last radio or the last record company I worked for, we were sitting around the breakfast table and, and uh, everybody was talking about their first their first concerts. And some people, you know, people were throwing all these different bands out there. And when I said it was Edward Bear, uh, oh. everybody, what? <laughs> who? Oh my God, who are they? And they Leave so the light they on. Were, they uh they were from the late sixties and early seventies. And Oh my God, they were talking about shows going with their mother and, and to see whoever it happened to be. And Oh, I remember working that show and I realized, Oh my goodness. So all of a sudden I, I, I didn't feel old, but I realized I was older than I thought, but I've been able to manage my energy much my, like my peers here. They, the, the panel here I can tell has good energy and, and, I think that's really important too, because it kind of erases numbers in a lot of ways. The way that it really exemplifies itself is when I become my parents, when all of a sudden <laughs> there's a computer problem where I have to call somebody in to help me and they just roll their eyes and go, yeah, old guy or whatever it happens to be, they laugh at it. Or it's when that sort of thing happens and it it, it manifests itself that way. But otherwise, I'm fortunate to work in the sports world. Uh, I don't think too many people are too, they know I'm not going to be beating them out for a job on the Toronto Maple Leafs blue line by any means, but I can contribute some history that they're always quite amazed at and, 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 and I can keep up energy wise with whatever's going on. There's never a problem that way, but yeah, it's just strictly the, uh, the computers and things of that sort. Can you help me change this? And I can't figure out why my iPhone isn't uh, yeah. Have you turned it off and put it back on? Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that that's all of a sudden when it, uh, they realize that yeah, Kevin's a little bit older than most of us. Yeah, so. <laughs> so tell me, We've talked about how it's happened to us and what we've done. What advice would you give people that are kind of playing with the thought of, I would really like to do this? You know, to me, I would say, if now, when? You know, what advice would you give someone ready to, or not even ready, just really playing seriously with the thought of, I would like to do this? Wow. Now, when you say ready to do this, are you talking about pivoting at, a, at an advanced age? Yeah, I, yeah. I'm talking about, okay, um, I'm 59, my job's over. I'm 64 at this job, like some jobs now, you're 65 and out. Like you have no choice. So you're 63 or 64 and it's like, well, I what am I going to do after that? Because... Um, I don't quote me on this, but I know that depression, as we have spoken about, accelerates after retirement because the people feel that there's no, they have no purpose. No hope. No, right. you know, so, 
And, you know, in the back of your mind, you're going, well, I, I can't, I'm not a sit at home person. So what am I going to do? So if they're playing with the idea of maybe doing theater, of maybe writing a book, of maybe going back to school, I never got to go to school before I had to work. Now I can go to school. What would you say to them that are playing in their mind? I would, I would like to do that. What's going to be that one push on the shoulder to do it? I think one of the things is the context of the shift or the pivot, right? If you're in charge of it, if you're initiating it, that's a very different experience than if you walk into work and they say, thank you for your contribution, but you've been replaced by a robot, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And so we know with change that if you have time to prepare, uh, it helps a great deal with managing the change and the loss. Mm -hmm. But if it's sudden and you don't have time to recover, that's a very different conversation. And if you're going and making this pivot and change voluntarily of your own initiative, well then, I mean, have at it. Yes, um, follow your heart, follow your dream. It's your choice. Do you have the resources? Do you have everything that you need? And if not, well, you'll figure it out. What do they say? Jump off the cliff and open your parachute or build the bridge and they will walk over it or something. So I think the context of how you're going to be pivoted, the reason that you're pivoting is probably the first part of the conversation that I would want to have. Mm -hmm. How important is support when you've made that choice? Huge. And if you're talking about resilience, we know from research, especially with children who have come out of war-torn war countries, that if you have one significant relationship, it can make the difference. So if you have one person who believes in you, and I'm so blessed, I have more than I can count on all of my fingers and toes. But if you have one person who believes in you and one person who supports you and says, I know you can do this, just go. You, if, we'll be here if you need anything, but just go just one. Yeah, I, I would say if you're if it's kind of niggling in the back of your head, and you're thinking to yourself, should I do this? That is your answer. You should go do it. If you're waiting for your sign, this is your sign. Go do the thing. You know, um, I, I watched way too many of those um, YouTube videos that showed people in their whatever, their hundreds or their 90s. And I said, what did you regret most? And uh, I, it was very interesting to watch that. But I knew, I knew exactly what my regret was going to be at 99 if I didn't go do it, which explains why I'm here in Toronto. Bravo. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. I think we're reminded day after day after day, whether whether it's through social media, finding out colleagues who have passed or are ill or whatever, I think it, it reminds us immediately to uh, to value every moment that we've got, to enjoy every sandwich, because the time evaporates more quickly than any of us can ever dream. So, you know, and again, I think Linda's point was very well made, was that, that you know, it depends on the context at that time. But as you're coming towards, if you've got yourself a, a, a bit of a, a foundation already and you don't really have to worry all that much about money, then it's time to follow that dream. What was it? The palette is now there for you and, and you're never too old um, to, uh, to, to start again and, and do what you would always love to do. And, and it's time to do that. And whether that's painting, pottery, becoming uh, becoming a mentor in some way, whether it be as an instructor or just within your community. There's so many different things that you can do at that point. So it's it's find the palette and and dream and and allow yourself to fulfill those dreams that you've had. So what are uh, you know those are great, great closing thoughts. Um, I know that this is some for some people this is a very difficult conversation. Because it brings up a lot of emotion uh, and some bitterness, resentment. And I just, I really felt that telling people that you're, it's never, you're never too old. You're, it's never too late. Whether, you know, you have a dream, a passion, an idea, you know, whatever you want to do. And I don't want people to minimize what their dream or passion or what, if it's to have the best lawn on the block. Sure. It's, mm -hmm. it's that. I mean, you don't have to have these grandioso ideas of, you know, euphoria and I'm going to be a, you know, whatever. The smallest things make people happy. And I think it goes right back to never too old, never too late to make yourself happy. Happy is really, really important. I think you can all agree 
that support is great, your passion is great, but happy, happy is is the the power to your wagon there, I think. And we have 10 minutes left. Does anyone have anything they would like to add? Um, you, when you were just chatting, Laura, you reminded me of a, a story. So when I finally decided I was going to move to Toronto, I had um, I had a really good friend of mine who had an apartment here. It was actually in this building. And all of a sudden, one day, she posted online that she was looking for a roommate. And I just knew. I knew I was the roommate. I knew this was the chance. I was. It was never going to be any sweeter than getting to live with her for a short while while I sorted everything out. And um, I went and I told my mom, who was in her late 70s at this time, and she was mad as can be. She just looked at me and said, what do you mean you're moving to Toronto? How dare you? Blah, blah, blah. And I was just I, so taken back because my mom is a huge supporter of mine and she's always been encouraging. And I just thought, holy cow, that went a lot worse than I, you know, really thought that it was going to. And um, a couple of days later, she called me up and she said, I, I'm, I'd like to talk to you. And I said, all right. And I went over and she said, I owe you a huge apology. I'm really sorry. And I said, what do you mean? She said, um, I moved to Australia for a year and a half. I have no right telling you you can't move to Toronto and you have my support and good luck. Oh, I mean, like I yeah. said, it, leaving my kids and my parents is, has probably been the most challenging of any of it. Um, but, you know, even if you do have those people who are kind of, you know, roadblocks or barriers or whatever, there are ways to overcome that. Um, and, and to be happy, you know, it's not like you find the end of the rainbow and there's a pot of gold and that's what's going to make you happy. I think that happiness is a choice that you make and it doesn't matter whether you're five or 55 or 105. Every day that you wake up, you decide that you're going to be happy. You know, you're going to be happy with your breakfast and with your encounters and with the people in your life and the people at your job or the people, you know, criticizing your perfect lawn or whatever it is, you know, you just make the choice to overlook the negative or deal with the negative and, and to choose that happiness. Um, and I really liked earlier in our conversation too, when Kevin was talking about being determined, you know, when he got to this part of his job or this part of his life, he was determined to ha have success. And then when it was the next part, he was determined to have success there too. And I recognize that. And it's something I've seen in you too, Lori, like, is like good luck trying to get me not to be successful because that is what I am here for. Wendy, I'm fascinated by your, your trajectory here. Can you walk us through how, <laughs> not from the beginning, but just through the, uh, the latter part where all of a sudden you're doing headshots and demo reels or whatever it is that you did and getting that first role, whatever it happened to be. Can you, can you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So I was a medical secretary for nine and a half years. I decided I couldn't keep doing that every day. So I went back to the University of Windsor. I really, really wanted to do my BFA, but uh, my dad was a very authoritative man. And I would be arguing, I would still be arguing with him, even though he's gone, about why I chose to do that. So I chose English, even though I was a, um, an older adult, um, knowing full well I really wanted to do acting. And so I settled for a Windsor Light Music Theater, where I was cast in never a lead role, never done a lead role there to this day, but I'm a dancer and I did a ton of ensemble and had the time of my life. And it was really my escape. Going to rehearsal twice a week just brought me absolute joy and being on stage was so much fun. My theater family is still a critical, critical part of my life. So I really thought that was going to be it. I would just be in theater productions at the Chrysler Theater in Windsor for the rest of my life. And I never thought much beyond that. But I had uh, met a girl there who wound up becoming an agent in Windsor at Fusion Talent Agency. And I remember clear as a bell thinking, there's no talent agency in Windsor. Surely I would know about it if there was. Um, and so I was very, very nervous. And I called her up one day and I said, hi, Haley, you know, like, what, how do I get on your roster? What do I have to do? And she's like, oh, do you want to act? And I said, yeah, yes. And she said, oh my gosh, you're in. I've, I've been on stage with you. Like, I know you're acting. And I was like, what? I said, okay, what do I have to do? And she said, well, you have to get professional headshots and you have to be willing to go to Toronto. And I thought, perfect. I'll have so much fun getting headshots and I'll probably get called to Toronto once every year or two if I'm really lucky. And, um, and that was really what I thought. And I thought, I'll have the best time when I go up to Toronto once if I'm lucky. And I got started getting called and I got called and called and called and I was commuting to Toronto somehow. Um, I'm really not sure exactly why that happened, but it did. Um, and one of the first projects that I landed was a feature film, which is unheard of. 
Um, I had speaking lines. It was a small principle. It's not even like I had a one line. I, I had scene after scene. Uh, I was very, very lucky. And that um, film is called Clash, and it hit Netflix worldwide this July. Congratulations. Yep. Wonderful. Yep. So thank you. So yeah, I still act. Haley is still my agent. She's based out of Windsor. Um, and I was at a callback today. I took my lunch hour and did my callback and um, have been just phenomenally, phenomenally, phenomenally. I can't say that today. Phenomenally lucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you were Haley's comet, as it were. <laughs> oh, Haley's my comet. Yeah. Haley's my mm -hmm. comet. I'm going to call her that from now on. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> So, Linda, closing remarks. I'm in awe of the other people on this panel tonight, Kevin and Wendy, and for their stories and for the hope and the optimism and the courage that you have shared tonight that can be a beacon for those who are still wondering if their dream is alive if it's worth pursuing, and if they have what's what it takes to achieve their goals and their dreams and their hopes. So thank you for being so willing to share your stories with them and just to be that person that they can look to as the one who made the difference. Wow. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for being part of this podcast. And uh, I want to leave you with uh, something that someone said to me uh, about music. It was that all the classic rock acts up until COVID were still on the road, uh, you know, and there's no place for radio for them to, to play their songs. So on the road is where they make their money. So one uh, working backstage at Blues Fest, uh, someone said, oh, my God, they're still here. And I went and so are, you know, um, Led Zeppelin, and so is, you know, people even like Richard Marks have been doing it, and, and, and all the, I would kept naming all these, yeah, they're still here, and they're still creative, and they're still on the road, and they're still recording, and he said, yeah, but there's no radio for them. I said, but when you're a musician, or an artist, or you do these things, it doesn't matter. You can pick up your guitar at any age, at any time, or sit at the piano, or draw, or paint, or, you know, do your lawn in a different pattern. I mean, we're still here. We're still here. We're still here, and that's really, really important. So to the young guns, I have to say in conclusion, buy the shoes, eat the cake, take the trip. You're never too old. It's never too late. I listen to the Archies so that you could have the Rolling Stones who are on tour as I speak and they are past 70. Thank you. This has been a Seniors View. Production staff, Lois Rinlisbacher. This podcast was produced by Sikander Salim. Thank you.